Hey, it's great to be here with my buddy Joe P, my dear friend. Yo, Eddie. And uh, they're here at DW, hanging out with all the cats and just talking shop. Beside working here, they're all drummers. Look out for I know. these guys. And they can play, too. <laughs> That's for sure. So, Joe, how did you get started in the business? Well, uh, my dad, you know, he was a carpenter by trade. But uh, in Italy, he was a trumpet player. And uh, when he got here, you know, First World War was on. And as soon as he got here, they drafted him, you know, and he ended up in France. Because they asked him, like, who do you want to fight for? Yeah. You know, you want, because Italy was on Germany's side, you know. Yeah. And he said, no, I want to fight for the United States. So he was an engineer. You know, he made those wood rafts that went across the Rhine River and stuff like that. Wow. But anyways, when he came home from the war, he couldn't play trumpet anymore. You know, he kind of had trouble with his teeth. Yeah. But he could read very well, and he always kind of fooled around with the snare drum. So the Italian symphonic band, this was back in New Britain, Connecticut, they had him play snare drum. Far out, that's wild. Ta Italian American War veterans, you know, they wow. had a, 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 a drum corps also. So he had been playing snare drum for a while. So he started teaching at the yeah. drum corps, yeah. teaching, you know, the fundamental rudiments, yeah. you know, the the two four cadence, you know, yeah. dun, 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 dun. Sure. and then the six eight cadence. Those were the only two cadences you played in the drum corps. Six right. eight. Dun, 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 you know. Wow. And you heard him play around the house. So he used to. No, he used to take me with him. Oh, he used to take you with. I was him. like around five years old. So I used to watch him and watch him. So. And my brothers used to come sometimes, too. I had two brothers. So then when we got to be seven, eight years old, he had us play in the drum and bugle corps. You know, we learned the cadences, Yeah. yeah. you know? And my oldest brother played bass drum, and my other, uh, my old, uh, other older brother, Dom, played snare drum, field drum with me. You know? Yeah. So anyways, from there, you know, we moved to Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, one day I was at... Uh, catechism and uh, the priest father toscano wanted to know who played an instrument because every friday we had cyo dances catholic right. youth organization so he wanted to start a band so i raised my hand because i played in that church's drum corps me and my brothers we played in that drum corps also so he said well and then amo richards the great vibe oh, yeah. player you know, he oh. was there with me. We lived, you know, a few blocks from each other. So we sang in the choir together, things like that. So he raised his hand and said, I play, I play xylophone. So there we were every Friday. We played for CYL dances. We played polkas and waltzes all night long. Wow. That's all Father knew. You know, he yeah. didn't know any hip, yeah. you know, so dance tunes. So yeah, I told him, but I don't own a drum set. So he says, well, we got to put together a drum set. I says, well, we could get some of the drums from the drum corps, like the bass drum. And in those days, they were like 12 by 22. You know, so I said, we need spurs so the bass drum won't roll over. Yeah. So we, you know, he took me to a used music store and we bought some spurs. And then I told him, we need a foot pedal for the bass drum. And... I already had a snare drum and snare drum stand. So we needed, you know, we didn't even think about hi-hats. So my drum set was my father's Ludwig, you know, five and a half by 14 uh, snare drum. Right. And a, a field drum from the drum corps. Uh, we, I put it on the bass drum with my one of my father's long screwdrivers he was a carpenter you know? yeah and i put it between the rods to hold the top <laughs> that's why and that's why we got the spurs so it wouldn't fall over that's and then we i took a cymbal from the drum corps and we had to buy a cymbal stand and that was my drum set yeah but the the, the great story about it is that we had a you know the, my my buddies that i hung out with we had a little you know uh group and he was by the state theater where the big bands used to come in. And 
Tommy Dorsey band was at the State Theater with Louis Belson. So when Louis came out, my friend Anthony went up to him and says, hey, we have a little band that we're going to start at the, our church. And would you come and, you know, check us, you know, check our drum set out and all that. Here's, here's our drummer. And he introduced me to Louis. So Louis came with Charlie Shavers, the trumpet player in the mm-hmm. band, and they both came. And when Louis walked in that room, he saw that drum set. He cracked <laughs> up. And, <laughs> and he sat right down and started wailing. And yeah. man, it was a drum solo. <laughs> it was incredible. It's right, you only have one bass one drum. One bass drum. <laughs> But the thing about the story, too, is that, just real quick, when I moved to L.A., one of my first gigs was subbing for Louis' percussionist, Louis mm. Belson Band, was at Dante's. Okay. And Jack Arnold was the Vi player and uh, Kunga player for Louis. He called the answering service. He needed uh, you know, somebody to sub for him. And they told him, well, there's a new guy in town that just moved here, and uh, Joe Picaro. And he said, yeah, get him for me. So there I am at Dante's Restaurant playing for Louis Belson, and I'm set up with the vibes and the conga drum right behind him. And I'm freaking out, like, because he does, you know, I'm much older now, right? I was just, you know, 15 yeah. or so, 14, 15 years old. When that happened at the church, so I'm behind him, man, I'm almost in tears, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm nervous as all hell, too. So when the gig was over, I went up, tapped him on the shoulder. I says, Louie, I says, do you remember me? And he says, well, what are you talking about? When? What? You know, and I yeah. said, well, years ago, we invited you to come to our church rehearsal hall and you played on a drum set we put together out of the drum corps drums. And he says, oh, my God. He says, I, I remember that very well. Are you Skinny? And that's what was my nickname, yeah, skinny. skinny. He remembered that, man. That's wild. Can you imagine? Yeah. So anyways, I think, him, by the way, that symbol you're using is an incredible, beautiful symbol. You know what he does? He goes over, he takes it off the stand, he hands it to me, he says, here, take it. You can oh, have wow. it. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. One of my first gigs when I moved to L.A. was with Louis Belson. Not a wild story. That's a great story, Joe. That's a great story. Yeah. Well, I remember, you know, when I was starting out as a kid, I was in Niagara Falls, New York, and I was, I was teaching at this music store on Monday night, D'Amico Music. And you had an article. You were actually on the cover of Modern Drummer Magazine with Jeff, and it was called The L.A. Scene. Okay? And... You guys had it. It was a huge interview. And I'm sitting there. It's snowing. It's like 30 below zero. You know, it was one of those Buffalo Niagara Falls nights. And then Tommy Tedesco, who um, was from Niagara Falls, who I met when I was 15 because he had a, a, he had a guitar clinic at that music store upstairs. And about 25 or 30 guitar players showed up. I think it was 20 bucks. Well, I, I was 15, and I went there with my $20 and threw it down, <laughs> and I was the only non-guitarist there, the only drummer there. So uh, Jerry, who owned the store, said, hey, you know, there's a kid who's a drummer here. And he goes, a drummer? Really? And he goes, well, where is he? And he goes, he's right there. So he comes up to me and goes, you're a drummer, and you came to the, the, the clinic? He goes, oh, okay. He goes, that's great. I go, yeah, I want to learn. You know, I want to learn about what you're doing in, in L.A., Exactly. So I sat there. I was looking at all the charts that he brought. He handed out a lot of charts, film stuff that he did, gut string stuff. So at the end of the night, uh, he goes, yeah, you know, if you ever get out there, give me a call. Because I said, I want to, I want, I'm going there. I'm going there. So two years later, I, I'm, I'm 17 now. I'm in town. There's some cats who are coming back from Fredonia and Berkeley, Frank Accardo, then worked with Sammy Davis. Pete Melaverne, he's a New York piano player. Pat Perez, great sax player. He's in Toronto still to this day. These cats used to come back from music school. So I got them together in my parents' basement, and I recorded us, and we played, you know, standards. I would go around and book us. Now, legally, I'm not even supposed to be in the clubs, but I would meet the owners, club owner, whatever, and I'd hang out and say, look, these cats are back from school, and 
He goes, man, you look like you're 11 years old. I said, no, I'm 18. You know, I was 17 <laughs> at the time. So we started playing, and I started doing these gigs. Well, then Tommy came home to visit family. He goes, hey, where can I sit in, man? I want to go play somewhere. He goes, remember that kid who was 15? Jerry, he was at the music store. He goes, he's, got, he's down at Comerford's playing down by the water there. And Tommy goes, what do you mean the kid who was 15? He goes, well, he's 17 now, and he's got his, he books a band while the guys are come home from college, you know, from music school. And he goes, really? So he comes down, and he plays with us the whole set. So Tommy goes, are you, are you thinking of coming out? I said, yeah. He goes, well, you got to come out. You, you got to call Joe Picaro when you come and, you know, take some lessons from him. So I said, I'll, I'll be there. So I played six months in the show band, saved up a bunch of bread, and moved. Okay, I got to town, I called you. I remember. So I started studying with you. You helped me with my hands, right? You and you, me took, with... you took some mallet lessons, I too. did for I a while. You, you know, get some mallets under your hands. I was studying with you. I was studying with Ralph Humphrey. I was studying the odd meter thing. And you were, I was studying technique with you, but a bunch of stuff. I remember everybody would always come to your house and ask you, Joe, I need to borrow something. Can I borrow... I need, I'm doing this thing. Can I borrow? I, I don't have the right symbol to play a, sus, a suspended symbol role. I mean, everybody used to call you. Cats would come over all the time. Joe, can I borrow something? I would call you. would be like, it was like the open door policy. Come over <laughs> to the house. I mean, it was crazy. You were so, you know, you were so kind with that, I remember. You would well, always, everybody you know, would be over there. That's, that's my uh, makeup. You right. know what I mean? I know. Uh, because when I moved in town, sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're new in town, you know, <clears throat> you're invading, you know, mus musicians' territory. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're new. They're established. You know, you have to be very, very careful about that, you know. But I did so many rehearsal bands. You know, that's how I got started. Yeah. You know, some of these kids that may be watching this, you know, uh, Hopefully, <laughs> uh, when I moved in town, the first thing I did was I called up Amo Richards. You know, I says, Amo, okay, what do I do? Yeah. You know, I came out with four kids, $5,000. I sold my home. I got, I came out, you know, out of it with $5,000. And I was playing in the Hartford Symphony at right. that time. You know, 17 years I played you know, in that symphony orchestra. I auditioned for it when I was 17 and got the gig. First percussion. So all those years playing all that music, 17 yeah. years, Bartok, Stravinsky. My last gig, I played the second timpani part to the Rites of Spring. You know, things like that, Bartok. Yeah, the classics. All legit. And that's the same time. And, you know, uh, in my situation as a drummer percussionist, and I was lucky because I had an incredible drum teacher, Al Pack. Yeah. He's written some great books. He was my teacher. Yeah. I know. I did his book with you. Right. Exactly. Well, anyways. Stuff wasn't <laughs> easy to play. No, Four-way coordination about thing. It. So when I came out here, you know, I was prepared. You know, I had a great musical background i didn't graduate any music college or anything like that but i had incredible experience uh you know so and at the same time i was playing in the jazz club you know i played with donald bird zoot sims bob brookmeyer all, you know monday night jam sessions mike manieri and then from mike manieri i went on the road with him for a while you know so I had a jazz background yeah. and a uh, percussion background. And the most th important thing about that was that when I came to LA and when I and started, you know, my name got around thanks to Shelly Mann, people like that, you know, I uh, when I started doing TV film and movies, yes. you, you go in in the morning. And there's a full orchestra, 65 people. Full orchestra, strings, you know, percussion, three percussion yes. players. 
uh, Mission Impossible Hawaii Five-O shows like that. And the contractor, because of Shelly Mann, told him, I, you know, I was a jazz drummer also. They found out that I played drums. So what the contractors did and the composer, in the morning, you know, there'd be Shelly on drums, I'd be playing temps or percussion, and, a, you know, another mallet player. And in the afternoon, the orchestra broke down from 65 all the way down to 25 musicians. Yeah. And when they found out that I played drums, they let Shelly and those guys go because they needed me on, per on percussion to play temps and vibes and bells and whatever. But they had some drum cues. And because Shelly, tell, you know, telling them about my uh, drumming, because I played at Shelly's manhole with Chet Baker for a whole week. Wow. So Shelly found out, you know, the kind of <clears throat> jazz player I was, you know. So he recommended me for other gigs, too. He did the cymbals with his fingers he used to play, right? Yeah. He used to always tell me that. Backwards, like yeah. this. Weird sounds, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, he was, Shelly was incredible, man. Uh, he went too soon, you know. But anyways, getting back to me, you know, uh, playing drums and percussion, and it, it, actually, it was a Hawaii Five O date that this all happened. So my name got around in the studios that I was, you know, a, a good drummer. You know, when they needed one guy to play mallets, you know, percussion and yeah. drums. So I started, you know, Trapper John, uh, uh, Highway to Heaven shows like that. I did both. Yeah, I played. I was the only guy there because I played drums also. Right. And how that goes about, so people listening to this, is you know you work all morning on percussion, and at the end of the day, there's a scene in the restaurant, like you know, to be a vibe player on stage and so on. So they needed what they call source music. Yeah. So I would end up playing drums and playing with some some hip stuff, you know, the blues, you name it, you know. And that's how yeah, I, it, I really ended up. You right, know. and you were playing legitimate things, mallets, timpani, which is from your classical training. But then the fact that you played jazz and you knew tunes, you knew how to play tunes, you had the swing, the feel, that's why you were able to play on the other stuff. You crossed over back and forth, where a lot of guys don't in, in the right. orchestra because, right. and I was right. just having this conversation with uh, Michael Werner, who's with the Seattle Symphony, last week I was at a master class at the Music Academy of the West in Montecito. And uh, they were just doing cymbals, piatti cymbals and concert bass drum. Right? Gorgeous. And he had five of the fellows, the students, they're all young professionals, maybe 22 to 30 years old. They're just starting out in orchestras. When he picked up the cymbals and he would demonstrate the the tonality and the musicality it was incredible what he got out of it. and then all the ideas on the concert bass drum he would turn it sideways he would dampen it and just but i noticed when he played because i was talking about this with him afterwards for, for about a half an hour i said why is it you know i know what classical music you're not supposed to tap your feet i said but i noticed you were doing a thing with six triangles you were the only one i saw a little bit of movement down with your toe where the grooves come up from the earth up. The younger kids were very stoic, planted in the ground. I don't feel as much emotion from them as I do from when you play. And he started, and I go, and I notice this when I go to NYU to teach, when I go do my clinics, and Jonathan Haas brings me in, who's the timpness. He does both, because we've talked about it. And he started laughing. Michael Warner started laughing. He goes, it's funny you say that, because I'm always trying to get them out of their head to loosen up because when you work for a specific composer or conductor, they want something else out of you. And it's not just this technical thing. I go, it has to, I go, yeah, it's got to come from the earth up. And you feel it, whether the fact you can make noise with your feet, you know, doing this, obviously you can't. But, but he said, it's a, it's a, it could be a problem. They get, they're too, too stiff, too stoic, right. you know? So the fact that you had, the jazz background. Yeah. I right. came up playing that way too, jazz. And then you, what you taught me when I studied with you was 
when I had to play more of a legitimate snare drum piece, like for instance, we look at the Sarone book or something, right? Um, that I would, I would, you would count triplets ta ta, right? And I always right. counted triplets anda. And I always, when I thought of jazz, I always thought of anda, one anda, two anda, three anda, four. But if I had to play something more straight, I always thought of the ta ta, one ta ta, two ta. It helped me be more. Yeah. Classic for me. I mean, this was just something I did for me, right? Because uh, uh, because sometimes you like you always used to say, yeah, you'll slip and you'll get loose. You're playing a part. Like right. I remember, um, you taught me this. Uh, I got back from the road with the Bob Marimba band. Julius Wechter wrote all Herb Alpert's hits, and um, Frank DeVito didn't do the tour the last tour, and then I was lucky they did a record. So I did the tour and did the record. So Julie Greenberg, who was a friend of yours, and Julie did right. The Simpsons all those years, right? Great, great percussionist. Great mallet player. Right? Yes. He was on that gig. So we got back. Benny Golston called me. Now, I love Killer Joe, and I, lo I would love <laughs> Whisper Not and all those tunes. I right. knew them right. backwards and forwards. I played them. A so he calls me on the phone. He goes, yeah, Julie told me about you. You just got off the road, blah, blah, blah. I, I'm doing, I'm writing jingles in town now. Um, can you do my date? So I show up, and it's like rhythm section, and then small like woodwind, like bassoon, a couple clarinet. You know what I mean? Right. So Garfield's playing piano. David Garfield? Yes. So we look at each other, and we're going, man, we're going to play like some smoking Ben Benny Golson chart. <laughs> and there's no music on the stand. Stands empty. And we're thinking we're going to be like, you know, something, something Killer Joe-ish, maybe, you know. So two minutes before the hour comes, here comes the music. Joe. It's, it's, a, it's a cartoon. Oh, my God. So there's more tacit, you know, rest, more counting than right. playing right. in the 30-second cue. And it's going all over the place. Three, four, four, four. Tacit for two. Seven, That's eight. because they have to catch the of action course, on the of screen. Of course, So I see this now. And there's Radomy cues written, right? Rakatakon, things like that, right? And then there's two bars of seven, eight. All it says, um, slash, slash, slash with the dot. So it's two, two, three, right? Right. And um, says March. So the only re so I get through it the first time. But the thing's so hard, you really can't memorize it. You have to read it every time. Like, like things that you talk, you got to read it. You can't say, oh, I got this now. Oh, it's taking on a certain form shape. You got to read it every time. You got to count to yourself or you're going to be lost. It's all new. It's all new stuff. So I remember every single time, man, I was focused. And then when it got to the march, what got me through was the, you know, Ralph, the two, two, three. I saw it the first time. You know, the two bars and then back. Then, you know, it was stuff like boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba. But you could go, bah, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But so, but it's the counting. You know, you always just say repetition with the counting, repetition with the count, and that's what got me through there. Because you know, we were thinking we we're going to be like, you know, throwing down a groove. It was complete. It was it was legit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was legit, and and putting that time in got me through that. You telling me every time. The repetition, the repetition, the sound, the repetition. sound. That word repetition, I'll bring up a story later, you know, as one of our things to get into. But I want to uh, uh, kind of focus on a little bit now on uh, when I, f to help students and drummers that are, will be listening to this, you know, they may have a, a dream like I did. Yeah. Of, you know, coming to L.A., you know, because we used to get so much of that at, when I was teaching at PIT. Yeah. Like, okay, you know, when class first started, okay, why are you here? Right. Why did you come to PIT or Lama, L.A. College, where I am now? Yeah. You know, I want to get in the studios. <laughs> right. You know, right away, they want to get in the studios. They have no idea what it takes and the pressure yeah. that it is playing in the studios. You know, you go in 
and you get a part that you're featured, and if you blow it, that's the end of your career. It's yeah. that simple. Yeah. It's that simple. Of course. I always you know. say make one mistake, but don't make it again. Yeah, exactly. So when I moved in town, <clears throat> my background, you know, playing in the Hartford Symphony and all that, which we talked about earlier, uh, first thing I did was join an answering service. That's what Amo Richards and the guys yeah. told me to do. Harlan's. Was it yeah, Harlan's? either one. But anyways, because you, the whole thing about this, uh, you know, to let your audience know, is that you never know. When you come to a place like L.A., you know, first of all, you have to be an, a really good musician to start off. I don't care what instrument you play. But the main thing is, like, what happened to me, the guy upstairs must have been looking out for me because I joined a service, and after a week, a week, I get a phone call from the service. Can I sub for this percussionist, uh, great vibe player and jazz teacher, Charlie Shoemaker? Oh, man. You know. I just saw him. He wanted to know, they want, the service wanted to know, could I sub for him? There was, um, he had a rehearsal at SC with the uh, timpanist Bill Kraft, who is a composer, yeah. also a great composer, yeah, beside being a great timpanist. And he was having a rehearsal at SC, Southern Cal, you know, uh, college. And he wanted to know if you could uh, play vibes for him. Well, you know, <clears throat> I, I did some mallet playing with the Hartford Symphony after Emma Richards left and all that. But, you know, going into the studios, I got a little nervous. So I asked, I says, ask him if I could see the part. This true story. It's a story of encouragement. Yeah. So he, he came personally. He came to my house in Sherman Oaks and brought me the, the vibe part. I looked at it and I said, yeah, I can. I saw it right away that I could handle it. Right. You know, there was a lot of notes, but it wasn't that difficult. So he says, okay, you, you'll go tomorrow night. It was the next night. So I go to SC, and there's a bunch of percussion students hanging around. They want to check the rehearsal out, you know. So I grab one of them, and I says, where's Bill Kraft? He says, the gentleman's over there. You know, he's over there talking to some of the students. So I go over and, you know, he finally stops talking with them. I said, hi, uh, Bill Crafts? Yeah. I says, I'm Joe Picaro. I'm new in town, but I'm subbing. I got a call to sub tonight uh, to play a vibe part. Charlie Shumi called me. He says, he called you to come here? He says, he didn't call me to tell me that he wasn't coming. He says, did you look at the part? He was kind of a little bit nasty, you know. Yeah. He was upset. He didn't expect you. Yeah. So I, I says, yeah, I looked at it, this and this and that. He says, okay. He says, um, so we do the rehearsal. And he comes up to me after. He says, okay, uh, very good. He says, uh, for not seeing it, you know, it will, he doesn't know it, but I stayed up all night practicing the part. <laughs> so anyways, he says, uh, how would you like to do the concert? I says, what do you mean, concert? He says, well, this is only one piece that we're playing. You know, we're playing Lenos by Stravinsky, and I want you to play the field drum part. And I says, well, what about Charlie? He says, no, I'm not going to. If you don't want to do it, I'll get somebody else. But he never even called me that you were coming. I says, well, in that case, I'll do it. So he says, well, it's not only Lenos. There's a composer coming over from France, and he's uh, Pierre Boulez, famous oh, composer, yeah. conductor. He conducted the New York Philharmonic for a while, you know. So I says, wow, okay. So I go to the next rehearsal, you know, we rehearse, and uh, Stravinsky's there at the rehearsal. He was alive then. 
it's wild. Can you imagine? Yeah, it's great. So anyways, what I'm getting at, you do a concert like that, and what happens? Your name goes on the program as, you yeah. know, one of the, you know, and percussion players. So who's there at the concert? You know, Lalo Schifrin, right. music contractors. Yeah. And they see your name on the contractor, you know, percussion, Joe Porcaro. Next thing you know, I'm getting phone calls. Yeah, you're working for Lalo. And I'm working for Lalo Schifrin all of a sudden, yeah. out of nowhere. So you never know, just going to a rehearsal yeah. for another player. Yeah. What happens? Absolutely. Or you taking a walk in the park. You, took a, you were taking a walk in the park, and this guy walked with you. And his name was Steve Tyrell. Yes. And Steve was... Steve would put a studio together with See, Barry Mann and another, Cynthia Wilde. Another story, how Barry, things happen. Barry Mann, legendary songwriter with his wife, Cynthia. And he's going, I'm working with a lot of different songwriters. I got Joe Sample coming. And he's trying to get another street life, blah, blah, blah. I'm looking for guys to do rhythm section arranging. And at the time, I had a partner, David Alfonso. We had the studio. And we were starting to do rhythm section arranging for all the composers and, and people we were working for. So... You give him my name, I go down, and we talk. The next thing he knows, he calls me, and we do a session. I get David down there, and we're doing sessions together. We're programming, we're playing, we're, we're working on all the demos that Barry's doing. So the next week, I get a phone call from Joe Sample. Okay? <laughs> hey, I'm writing a song in Barry's office with a couple of guys. We're, you know, I'm trying to get another street life kind of song going, you know. Uh, I hear you, you, are the, you and your partner are the guys to, to work. I got two demos. Will you come to Babyo? So I go, me and David go. It's me, David, and Wilton Felder and Joe Sample. We do two songs, just the four of us together. We play all the parts. Right? So we go back to work the next week for, for Barry and, and for Steve. He goes, oh, yeah, Joe, like, what you guys did with them. Him and Wilton like what you did. They're starting the Crusaders record next week. You're going to get a phone call. So I go, wow, that'd be great. So I get a phone call next week. It's Joe. Hey, we're working on the Crusaders album. Tom Hooper does all the business. He's going to be calling you. We want you guys on the dates. So I worked with Joe for almost a year after that in the studio. I mean, we worked. We were at Babio all the time. Um, at Barry's, I had a little kick snare and hat. Upstairs, he had a Rhodes. We would start off sometimes just, I'd be playing grooves, Joe be playing Rhodes. We'd start off with songs that way. I had the Lindrum. I mean, we worked for almost a year until then when he split up with Wilton at that time because there was some tension. And then Tommy LaPuma took him to New York and he did that first Joe Sample album in New York with all the New York guys. But that's how I... That show was from your walk in the park with Steve. And then through Steve, working with him. That's how and things then happen. Joe called me. Wow. Well, well. I mean, just like you say, you never know. It's just out of nowhere. And like you said, you just have to be ready to do what needs to be done. I remember sitting in the booth where Wilton would say, we got Paulino da Costa coming in today. We want to replace all the Lynn percussion that you did. But we want them to play the stuff that you program. We want you in the booth with us to make sure that Paulinho's playing the parts. The, you did, right, them, you right. did them a big favor. And I'm just going, you need me to come and talk to Paulinho? <laughs> right? And he goes, we want you here. So I remember sitting there working with Paulinho, making sure we had everything lined up. We had so much stuff going on on this one song. But, you know, it was, and Joe loved, he was, he loved food and he loved the hang and he was he my mother would send biscottis wine biscottis <laughs> from back east he loved he liked the wine biscottis and the coffee we'd have them in the studio in the exactly. morning and he loved to eat we'd always go out and eat and hang out but i i didn't see him for a while and then one day i was at the bar at the at the baked potato and the bartender put a beer in front of me and i said well, what's this he goes he points and there's joe he was standing in the back and he went like this <laughs> He sent a beer over, and I went. Away. I hadn't seen him in a while, and right, right, you know, um, 
But what a, an incredible, just inc underrated, in my opinion, composer, writer. You know, he was, Who, so, Joe he was so gifted. What he, about his piano Oh, insane. Play? But that's my point. It did matter if it was 8 in the morning, because we'd work all different times. 4 o'clock in the morning, if we were tired, exhausted, hung out, whatever, he sounded the same. Every time he sat and played, he had that feel with the hump. And, you know, <laughs> right? And it was just, there was never, he always sounded like Joe. Eddie, they wanted you around also because you were a young blood, man. No, serious. I, you know, heard story from my son, Steve P. and Jeff, where Quincy Jones, yeah. you know, would, you know, when Steve and Jeff yeah. did some dates of with course. Michael Jackson, yeah. you know. Quincy was there, you know. Yeah. I mean, they, they wanted those young you yeah. know, guys from Toto to hang around. Of man. course. They were, you know, got a lot of ideas from them. David Page, you know. Yeah, the energy. Exactly. Joe, Joe left his, he worked on these voicings one day. You know, he had some really fantastic voicings that he would do. And he wrote them all out. He didn't even have them memorized yet. And he, he, he came from his house in Beverly Hills to the studio in Hollywood, baby -o. And we were there early, me and David Alfonso, who had an ear, my partner at the time, like no one else. Quiet guy, right? You remember David, way back in the 80s, right? Right, right. So Joe goes, <clears throat> I forgot my voicings. I'm going to drive home and get them, because I want to make sure I, I want to, because I had it really nice. Huh? David goes, Joe, you played the song yesterday. I know, and I saw when you did the new voicings. He's a guitar player now. He goes, I know the voicings you played. And Joe looked at him like, get the, what are you talking about? You have all the voicings memorized. He goes, honest, I do. Just watch, watch. He sits down at the grand, and he slowly, slowly goes through the whole tune, slow. And he's playing the voicings that he remembered. He played the next day that he heard Joe at the piano when he wrote, he was writing them down. And Joe looks at me and goes, who oh, no, is this guy? <laughs> and he, and they sat there and they wrote them all down and then we went to work and David memorized them from the day before. Can you imagine? So he didn't have to drive home. Great story. Far out. <laughs> now, I got to tell you the story uh, earlier I wanted to tell you about uh, Shelly Mann. Yeah. You know, Shelly was, you know, a real witty guy and all that. But we were doing a movie with Henry Mancini at Universal. I was on percussion, of course. Shelly's on drums. And that was at the moment, the movie scene, you know, with the electronics, you know, drum machines and sure. all that. But the producers, Universal, the head of music, they were bringing in these younger guys that were, you know, younger producers that wanted to kind of like bring in, get away from the jazz thing that was happening through all those years and more or less getting into the rock, yeah, you know, funk thing. And uh, so we were doing this one cue and it was like a chase scene. Yeah. You know, cars chasing each other and sure. all that. And, you know, the cue needed a lot of action. And Shelly's playing, you know, it, it's, you know, the click was, you know, here and he's playing, you know, and Henry stops the orchestra and he says, Shelly, uh, I'm through the earphones, you know, Henry's got his earphones on, we all did, you yeah. know, and you could see that uh, we, we need more out of the drummer. It's, it's what he's playing is not what we're used to. And these guys are, you know, the current rock electronics and all that sure. you know in fact uh shorty rogers great jazz trumpet player composer his son was in the booth <clears throat> he was new with the music department so they were looking for more out of the drums you know sound you know the snare drum you know like i told shelly let's go in the bathroom man get some paper towels you know fold it get some masking tape and loosen the head, like Jeff used to loosen one, you know, uh, yeah, tune it. Of course, one of detune the, the head down. So yeah, a little bit, you know, get that. Sure. Know. So, anyways, 
I'm seeing what's going on. And Shelly seemed flustered. So I went, you know, Henry says, I'll tell you what, let's take a 10, you think about it, and we come back, see what, if you can, you know, come up with something more action. So I says, should I go over and tell him, you know, give him, I, I wanted to make a suggestion. To sure. Him. But I did that once before to Louis Belson, and, you know, he, we were doing the Tom Jones show. Right. And the same thing happened. You know, uh, they, uh, Tom Jones's producers, they were all from England, you know, and they wanted, you know, different snare drum sound. So, again, they said, take a break and see if you could fix the snare drum. Well, with Shelly, I went over. I decided, hell, I'm going to go talk to him. Right. And I went up to Shelly. I said, Shell, because I knew he's got great chops. But he was just playing, you know, regular, t -t 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 -t, you know. I went up to him. I said, "Show, tell me if you want me to lay off, I'll lay off. But I think I know what they want. Yeah. And I said, my son Jeff showed me this inverted paradiddle pattern, you know. And knowing that Shelley's got incredible technique and he knows all, you know, rudimental stuff, I decided to go over, you know, yeah. and tell him. He says, well, what is it? What is it? He says, I don't know what the hell they're looking for. Yeah. So I... You know, the back becomes sure. like two sure. and four. And he started playing it. I says, that's it, man. That's all they're looking for. Just dig in and you got it. So yeah. the 10 is over. Henry gets up on a, you know, composer stand. Shelly, did you come up with something? He goes, yeah, I think I know just what you want. So he says, okay, the clicks, you know, four clicks, and he starts in, and, you know, he's got chops. Yeah. Boom, bat, you know, his thing. Henry's listening. He puts the phones down. He says, they love it. Do that through the whole movie. Every time we come to that cue, play that pattern. Right. So meanwhile, for months and months, Shelly and I worked together at Universal, right. you know. So on the vibe, I was playing percussion always. You know, they even made a drum booth for him, Shelly Mann. Yeah. You know, it was beautiful. Yeah. I remember you took me to a date. That's how dominant he With, was yeah. out there. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, and he I, always thought he didn't couldn't play the rock stuff because I remember the day yeah. you brought me. I was here. He goes, "You probably play this stuff way better than me." I said, "What are you talking about? You're Shelly <laughs> Mann. You play everything, right?" I mean, he would just dial. He would dial in and just right. play. You know. So I'm. You know, working on my new book, you know, yeah, how to apply rudiments to, you know, jazz. And sure. All that. So he goes, Joe, come on, you know, we're doing a date one day. And he says, come on, it's a 10. Let's go have coffee. You know, they had coffee on the vestibule, donuts and all that. I said, no, I got to keep working. I want to try to get this book out this year. You know, I'm got quite a ways to go with right. it. You know, he says, come on, man. Get rid of those rudiments you're trying to apply rudiments to jazz. Screw that stuff. Come on, let's go have. I said, no, I got to do this, man. I got to get it out. Right. So when that scene happened, I showed him the inverted right. paradiddle pattern. He looked at me, he says, I want to write the intro to your book. Right. <laughs> and it's there, you know, by yeah. Shelly Man. Oh, yeah, man. I have it. I used to shed the, what, where's the original? Is it the 26, the original was, was there 26 of them? The basic ones? The, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I remember well, coming up. Well, maybe there were at first 22, then 23. Yeah. But then I think it ended up, I mean, well, there's, there's what well, they not, call well, now, hybrid now. Well, now there's, but yeah. I mean, I remember shedding those 26, yeah. like constantly, yeah. you yeah. know, all, all different tempos, um, Religiously, I would do it. And to this day, even if I um, haven't played them, like the other day I took my e-pad and set it on the counter at the house in the kitchen, and I put, just put a pair of sticks there in a sleeve, and I've been waking up, and I've just been playing, just from memory, not opening the book, exactly. the Wilcoxon book, because yeah. I still know some of them. And I've just been starting to play a few of those, just basically by memory. I don't know how close I am, maybe... 80% I might be. Right. But just, and just remember by doing, moving your hands that way, how much 
you know, there's so many diamonds in there. And those rudiments, I mean, just that you could pull up and that you use. Your thing, I'll tell you, his thing, I've used it ad nauseum. The three-stroke rough. You know, that yeah. you, da-da-da, da-da-da, right? Well, almost all the rudiments. Yeah. You know, if I'm playing anything to get out of a line. Yeah. You know, your three-stroke rough to, you know. But it's all, of course, the book is divided. You know, jazz, rock, and then Latin. Yeah. But all the jazz stuff in my book is all based on the triplet. You know, they're all, you know, because it's jazz. What is jazz? Yeah. You know, jazz is all triplet yeah. playing, you know, phrasing. Yes. It's Joe, all, all triplets. You're, the thing you showed me years ago, I've used it uh, forever. And the T high. Oh. The East Indian thing. And then one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Right. You know, it's three threes. Yeah. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Right. right. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Da, da, da. Yeah. And then you're back right. to the symbol. Yeah. Beat, right? Yeah. So and the accents are one for the first measure, and the second measure, the accents on three. And jazz drummers through the years, going back to, you know, Zudi Singleton, Max Roach, all those guys, Kenny Clark, they, they were playing them, but they didn't have a name for them. Yeah. It was a feel for them. Yes. You know, where when I came along, I broke it down when I learned about tea highs, thank, thanking the Indian, you know, uh, musicians, yeah, like classical Zach, Indian. Like Zach here. Yes, exactly. That's a whole other story that I... We're going to touch. They on. get into those rhythms yeah. and they call them tea highs, right. you know. And you know, uh, for your audience, the tea high, to explain it, is a rhythm, a rhythmical phrase played three times. And the last note of the third time is the downbeat of the new phrase. So the T high works over two bars, like I said. One, well, the rhythm is one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right? You have to have that accent on one to stress the phrase. So if you put three of them together, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. If you break it down to counting and the rule of the T high, three times, and the last note of the third time is the downbeat of the new phrase. You have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. And then you're right. back to playing time. Right. So you take that three, doom, dick, 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 two, three, four. And Max used to do dick, 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 boom, dick, 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 boom, dick, 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 boom, dick, that's and great. so on. You just make yeah. up things yeah. in three, three right. times. Yes. And then the other thing, a thing I've used, is thinking of two bars of four, because you hear this in songs like, um, like Equinox, like So I look at it like two bars of four, three, four, three, four, two, four. And the last two, are, I call them free beats. You play whatever you want on those two beats. Right. Bang, 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 boom, 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 mm, 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 exactly. So you got that three within the two bars of four, and that's how they set up all those tunes that start off with the ostinato, and then they then they release on the B. Exactly. The B, boom. And then when the bass player starts walking, it's like that release, three, four, three, four, two, four, back and forth, and then you release, bang. And it really gives it somewhere to go between the two. And that's always, I thought, was a cool thing. And that Alvin used it. 
get into that a lot. And your original three, four, six stroke right, roll. Right, right. Ding, ding, dun, ding, and then basic one, back. So it's three, three, two, like you're talking about. Three, one, two. If you go over the bar line, yeah. then you bring the cymbal beat back on two. Watch. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> you, but you got to yeah. let the band know you're doing that. That's right. <laughs> but that, the, uh, that whole three thing. But what, it's interesting what you said because the more, the, oh, this is a great story. Years ago, it was early 80s. We were in, remember P1 at the old building at, at PIT? Yeah. The perform okay. Zakir was in town with a couple of the East Indian cats. For some reason, they got him there in that room. And it was late afternoon on a Friday. And, they, and he played on the stage. And you and I were standing in the back. And it's the first time I saw, I heard Zakir live. I had been listening to him. I bought all those Shakti records with John McLaughlin and him with the guys. And I used to, was listening to that stuff like crazy. He comes and plays that day, and I'm standing next to you, and I'm like this. Oh, my God. And I go, Joe, I, I feel like I can't I even play. Yeah. And you, and you go to me, Eddie, what's wrong with you? You realize how long he's been doing this? Since he was a little kid. And they started five years old. <clears throat> they have, his dad. Their first tabula teacher is they start at five until they're about 10. Yeah. And they graduate to another teacher. Yeah. And then at 15, they graduate a whole different teacher from what I'm told, yeah. and so on. <clears throat> so it's a lifetime. It was incredible. So they had a split right away afterwards, so we didn't really get to talk to him. So to this day, and I've seen him play a couple of times, I have not met him. You know, I've always wanted him to meet him. So he's playing at UCSB in October and this guy who he is he's a big donor and he, he he's sponsoring the whole thing he brought me to the music academy this guy is his name is Dick Macy's he's a great guy he sponsors a lot of the events there um, at the music academy of the west for the eight-week summer program he's been bringing me around introducing me to people there because I live in Santa Barbara now so he goes I go, Dick, you know, I wrote him an email. I go, thanks for bringing me, man. I really appreciate you introducing me to everybody. He goes, yeah, he goes, you know, we're sp I'm sponsoring the, the Zakir concert in October. He goes, I got a ticket for you so we could all, we'll hang in October. You're going to come to that. And I was like, oh, man, <laughs> you know. So he's going to come to UCSB, and hopefully I'll get to meet him finally, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I mean, I I brought – I know I don't play tabla, and I know you play some tabla. You play tabla on some of cues I've written for TV, and you've been to the yeah. studio and played on them yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I've used those rhythms, and with the finger technique, I use with djembe that I come da up with. Da te da te te taka da. <laughs> I, I haven't done it I, in a while. I mean, so I've. I've <laughs> they I, call them bowls. Yeah. <laughs> and I've I've put some of that those rhythms and technique onto the djembe, you know, and that's kind of become my thing when I play that instrument, especially when I work with Maria, she plays kunga, kungas, and, and, and I play one or two djembes, and it's not instruments that actually go together, but we've gotten this hybrid sound that we've done for years now. But it's all come from listening to, the, to him and to the other East Indian masters, and you're the one who originally turned me on to it, you know, talking about tabla. Yeah. And I remember one day being in the, your studio at Valley Heart. Yeah. And you were talking about Tabla, we were talking about stuff. And Jeff P came in and he goes, Hey, what are you chooches doing? And, <laughs> and we said, Well, we're talking about Tabla. And Joe's showing me this and that. And he goes, Well, hey, man, I got this song, Africa, that I'm writing. 
And he, he laid out the whole thing, and he started talking about the bass marimba part. And he goes, oh. Dad, you're going to be playing bum, be, bum, ba, bum, 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 on the bass marimba. Exactly. Be, be, ba, ba, boom, boom, boom. And I remember that. And then, then over it, he goes, there's going to be a... And he had the whole thing going on. And, and you know how Jeff always used to do this? With the group. <laughs> he do this thing. Exactly. And it freaked me out. But he had, he had the whole thing, man, from top, from the bottom up. And he was telling us about it. Yeah. We used the uh, Amo Richards... Bass marimba. He just got had a brand new bass marimba built for that, uh, not for that call, but he just, yeah. it was just done. And I, I called Amo personally and I said, look, because he had another bass marimba and uh, it was much older, you yeah. know, but this was just made by a gentleman in Pasadena. Just beautiful. And it tilted, you know, normally the marimbas are, yeah. you know, Horizontal. Oh, yeah. Marimba. Yeah, the ones I always see. This marimba, marimba uh, it had wheels on the side. You know, it was, of course, you know, really large. And you could tilt it because it was so high, too. You know, you're playing, you need a stool to play yeah. it. But we, uh, Amo had it made so that it would tilt on a 15 degree angle, whatever it was, you know. So it made it really easy to get up to the chromatics, you know. And, but, you know, you're playing a vibe. The bars are, you know, an inch and a half, two inches wide. This, the bars are, you know, so it's very easy to hit the wrong note. You know, dun, 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 dun. Yeah. And that note, dun, 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 that note right yeah. there, it was a C sharp. Mm hmm and, and Jeff said to me, Dad, you know, you have a gong. Not a big one, you know, just, you know. So right. I luckily, in my equipment, I had a gong, a Su Chow, mm -hmm. beautiful gong, Chinese Su Chow gong. And we hit it when the record, you know, when I was overdubbing it, it was a C sharp we lucked out. Wow. Just like the note on, wow. the, on, on the court. You know? Wow. Do, 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 yeah. do. That's great. And it's a little little bit flat, you yeah. know, just a little bit. But it was good enough, you know, you mix it with everything else yeah. that was close going. enough for before auto tune, thank <laughs> God. Right? But they ought now that you said that, let's talk about some of the uh the different kind of instruments that you would play sometimes. I remember one of the first big dates I did. As a songwriter and producer, you had timpani that we used, tune timp, but you also brought this giant animal jawbone. I call it like the funky vibroslap yeah. kind of a yeah. thing. And it was this big, and it was on a stand, and you whacked it, and it, it was just more darker, <laughs> where the vibroslap is more, you know. Yeah. It was, and it took... It, the vibra slap took the place of the you had You brought that on the date because I had, all, I had some of these sounds programmed and I wanted to replace them because this was a live record for Sheffield Lab. They only made live records. There was no overdubs. Exactly. I had this, this one song. They brought me in. They couldn't, they couldn't write the bridge. That's how I got involved with this first piece. They, um, they wrote the bridge three or four times. They didn't like it. The executive producers didn't like it, blah, blah, blah. The artist didn't like it was Claire Marlowe, right? So she goes, look, Ed's doing a couple other songs. Why don't we have him write the bridge? So I wrote the bridge. I changed the key. I think it was the, the original key was in C or something, and I went to A flat or something. I, I remember I changed the key. So they liked it, the bridge I wrote. So I remember you're on the date. You had mallets there. You also filled... Because I had all these things, I had samples of things, and I go, Joe, we're going to replay some of these, and you're going to play them live. I'm also going to play, run out from the booth and hit some things live, because we couldn't overdub them. Right. And then I'll just go back, I'll come out, play with you, <laughs> run back in the booth and listen, right? So we had all this computer-generated stuff going on. We actually had an Atari married to a Mac at the time, and they were running together via MIDI, and someone's job was to start it, and they chased each other, and they were in perfect time. And the, reason, and the way we would figure that out back then was 
I would take the program base sample parts and I would run them, both of them, on the same computer into the console and listen to them from beginning to end. And if they were out of phase, because they were, everybody would say, how do we know these computers are really lined up in time? I said, well, let's put the base parts up together from both, on both computers, run them up on two faders, listen back from beginning to end. If they're out of phase the whole way, they're in time. And I, I would prove it. There it yeah. is. Let's go. Let's do it. So you had all these bottles filled with waters, and you're hitting them with all these little different uh, rubber balls. Um, what were the super rub- balls? Yes, the super ball mallets. <laughs> so you had all that dialed in, replacing. So we would mute the stuff on the computer that was flying live MIDI to where everyone else was playing. You know, Abe Sr. was playing. There was real bass along with some program bass, Abe LaBoreal. We had uh, Dean Parks was playing guitar. You were playing. I was playing. Then Doug Norwine was playing Iwi, the electric valve instrument. He was playing the melody. Who was playing Doug that? Doug Norwine. He moved to Texas. He, used to play, he was a woodwind player. He played on all my stuff. He was a great reader. You, I remember you don't have to... You could write in concert, and he would transpose on the spot. You didn't have to write for the acts. You would just write... He goes, don't worry about transposing. He had all the horns. He had this, even this flute, E-flat flute, that was made for kids. It was a school thing. It was called E-flat flute. Thing was, there was no flute I ever heard like it. Right? He actually played it on my Christmas record. Um, but anyways, back to that track. So we got everything going, and we all played. And you, you played the water bottles. You ran over, and you played the tune Timp, because there was a synth big synth part that you doubled with temp the notes i remember that um you played some shaker you must have played four or five things i remember going out hitting the jaw bones i was playing some other stuff i, I don't even remember exactly what i was how many doubles did i get that day <laughs> everyone did good <laughs> that day I, quite Ex- a few explain to your audience well the dub- about a double is so if joe played the t- so if joe's main acts on the uh for the three-hour date was timpani, let's say. That would be, he would be paid, and if he was being paid scale or double scale, he would be paying, paid full on that. But then the next instrument he would play, he would get a double, which is 50% of scale. And then as the doubles went, they kind of tiered down. Down right? to 25%. There you go. They would tear down as they go. Um, and that's how it was done back in the day, <laughs> yeah. right, when it was all legit. Legit. Uh, <laughs> When there was a contractor, you'd keep track of everything. Exactly. Everything. Okay. Uh, so, but that was cu- some of the use of the new technology in with us playing. And that song was called The Major Technicality, and it did pretty well on the radio. It was instrumental. The rest of the record was of, um, all vocals. There was yeah, two cool. instrumentals. That was one. Jeff P. played drums on the other. I didn't produce that one. But then, there's. I want to talk about this, because this was a unbelievable thing joe and jeff were on the same date we were doing an old the artist she wanted to do an old stevie wonder song and she had me arrange it and it was i believe if i fall in love with you it'll be forever it was a ballad and you know how jeff played those slow rock ballads yeah. was, there was no one yeah. like it right um so it starts off i did it was randy um okay who played Randy Kerber played grand. Um, you were playing percussion. Jeff P was playing kit. Um, it was Abe Senior? I think it was Dean Parks. Yeah. So the piano pl- the piano tuner comes late, and the piano's not tuned. Now we're at a live date. You know, there's no waiting. So the tuner shows up late. The piano's out of tune. It's not tuned yet. And the whose whole, studio was that? It's Schnee's. We're in the big studio. room at Schnee's. The drums always set up in the right. room. It's a great right. sounding room. So the piano tuner comes late, and you know the whole. It's intro. It's her voice, p- grand piano, and I got Larry Corbett playing a counter melody cello line that I wrote with her voice. So it's exposed cello, grand piano, and her voice. Now the piano's got to be in tune because you know the cello's got a tune there's no no way yeah. so the guy's looking at me go how much long? you know it's already 12 i go we got to get how, how long he goes it's going to take me an hour and 15 i go no we don't have an hour and 15 minutes it's not gonna so lincoln Mayorga is standing next to me he's 
one of the owners of the label, and he's a classical piano player. Right. So he, he's looking at me, and I go, Eddie, why didn't you know? Why wasn't the piano playing Be, earlier? Before you go on, explain to the audience, uh, Lincoln Studio, Schnee's. But what about the one out at uh, MGM, Sheffield Labs? Oh yeah. Well, yeah, Sheffield Lab, they, these guys would modify all kind of instruments, tape machines, microphones. They would tell you sometimes to the singer, don't touch the mic. But You I, know, they, they, they were so hot. Everything was so hot. And Go ahead, go ahead. No. At MGM Studios, movie studios, the, where the famous movies are scored, it's humongous. Yeah. It's room. Huge. Yeah. And it's, they never changed it because the sound is so beautiful. Yeah. Never. Yeah. The same walls, everything is the same. Yeah. But Lincoln, on that soundstage, had a studio built, his own studio built with their own recording room. Yeah. Just like here, you know, back. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. And, this room. and Doug Sachs was the mastering engineer. He's, exactly. He had the mastering lab. Yeah. Yeah. We, we did a... a with James Newton Howard, we did that uh, live, you know, to disc. Yes. So anyways, we're playing this ballad, and Jeff Plee's playing Kit. And, and so back to the piano tuner. So, so Lincoln goes to me, so what are you going to do? And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, man, what am I going to do? So I go, I know what I'm going to do. So I, I go up to Randy Kerber. I go, Randy, where you, show me where your hands are going to be on this. Where are you playing, basically? He goes, he goes, well, here, here's, I, I'm not all over the place. I'm kind of right here. I get the piano tuner. I said, go ahead, show him. And he goes, I'm kind of right here. I go, tune those notes in 15 minutes. And the guy goes, what are you talking about? I said, tune those notes. So he does. And Lincoln's looking at me, Mark, and he's laughing. Huh. He's going, man, I didn't even think of that. So he tunes those notes. 20 minutes later, we start working. That's all you're going to use, those notes. We started working. <laughs> and it was, it, it was fine, right? So we start working. We're tracking. And you're playing this nice tambourine part, right? And we're, we, find, we do a couple of takes, and we take a 10, and we're listening. I got to stand up to do this. So, oh, you won't hear me, right? OK? So, so it's, we're on the 10, and it's, you're standing there. Jeff P's there. I'm here. And we're talking. And going. So Jeff turns to you and goes, Dad, your part sounds good. He goes, but I'm telling you, man, I hear this part. I want you to play this other part. It's a little simpler. So, you know, you, you go, yeah, here. So he grabs your tambourine, okay, and he goes, ka, 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 chaga to ka. And you and I look, we just go, whoa, too bad we can't overdub that. <laughs> right? And... But that was just Jeff P, right? You know, anything he would pick up, he would just dial in. It was like he was the groove. This is what I always lear learned from him being around him, that the instrument is in the way, and he's the groove, and it's just an extension of him. Exactly. So it didn't matter if he had, once at a studio I was hanging out, we went to Jeff's studio, he was sitting on the porch. You know, he'd always wait for you out front. When he was in Studio City, right. when he had a studio in the back where they right. did a lot of this Toto tracking, he was. I was talking to him, and he had a blastic in his hand, right? And there was one of those keyboard stands that have the little V, you know, in them, you know, space. And as I'm talking to him, his hand is in there playing this groove. Not like just some stupid thing. It was like hypnotic. I don't even think he knew he was doing it. So I'm listening to him talk, and then I'm listening to his left hand playing this thing and I'm just going and I'm looking and then he sees me and he goes what what's up and I go what are you playing man in the triangle I go mic that up <laughs> <laughs> I mean it was just but that was him that's my point the one time at the baked potato when he was playing a shuffle and Pops Papa was playing bass it was one of these he brought it down to his sticks and he got up and here's was Pops Papa well, amp and here's was just, and you know on the corner of the amp there's the little metal yeah he brought it down he's smoking a cigarette and he brought it from his his stick onto the onto that little metal thing playing the shuffle with his right hand really soft while really? he was soloing pops was soloing and he's down there just like this and he's smoking 
with his left hand, yeah. right? He puts the cigarette in his mouth. He Don't brings worry. it up to the stick, right? Back, walks over to the drum set. And then, and he takes it out. And I was sitting next to him, and I'm just going, holy crap. <laughs> but, but again, my those, point, those were my point was, it's not about the, his chops. Or the cho and Jeff had chops yeah. in his own way, even yeah. though he didn't like the song. But it was about his physical being emoting. It was the, he, was the, he was the group, and whatever he was he's doing, it's yeah. in the way. So I always used to tell students, if the drum set disappeared tomorrow and you're studied playing the drum set, what will you do if you woke up in the morning and that drum set's not there anymore? What would you hit? You're going to hit something. You're going to start playing something. Because if you got to get it out, it's not how fast your hands move. It's the emotional response, the channeling of getting it out. Yeah. He yeah. is the group. You are the group. And the instrument's just in the way. Yeah, I listened to them yesterday on podcasts. They had that show going on. Yeah, you know, it was, you know, because that was the anniversary of his passing, and all day from morning to yeah. the end of the night. Yeah, I heard songs I never heard yeah. before playing with, you know, groups I never even heard of. Yeah. It's just and, incredible. And some of the, just the lope he got in his, uh, tick -a -dun, 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 you know, bass drum. That and forward motion. Just, the shuffles were just, uh, you know. And the announcer mentioned when he was eight years old, he was driving and had the radio on. Eight years old. And he just said, the drummer, was just freaking me out, and it was a, a track he had made with uh, yeah. Voss Skaggs or yeah. somebody like that. Well, that's when the lope, and for people maybe who don't know the word, L-O-P-E, lope it com traditionally comes from like the horse's gait, right? Perfect. Yeah. And if you listen, Jeff would always talk about the lope, and if you look at, listen to his and watch his DVD, you'll see it in his hi-hat, how he creates the forward motion and how the, the snare drum is, is a little bit, maybe a little more laid back. Naturally, it just kind of happens. This is where he kind of put it, you know? And so you would get the forward motion, but then the centerness of the backbeat. And then his foot was just like a heartbeat. Like if you watch the foot in the DVD, you know, and he would slide up, you know, he'd wear those boots. I don't know how he did it, but <laughs> he would, it would just be like, it didn't matter if, if he was playing time or setting up an ensemble figure. What I always would remember the foot would never jump in any way. It would always just be the you know same. Why? You know why? I mean, guys practice hours and hours and hours. He developed that because he couldn't reach the foot pedal when he was really young. He finally got to the drum set. Yeah. You know, at first it was just a Remo practice set. Yeah. You know, but then eventually, you know, uh, I started letting him you know, use the drum set. And he couldn't reach the, you know, he just about reached the pedal. So he yeah. would, you know, do it with his toe. He didn't have his heel yeah. down. Not, everything was with his toe yeah. and sliding back and forth. That just became natural. He didn't, you know, learn that from anybody or, you know, just was a natural thing yeah. to do. Yeah. The other thing, man, I learned from him. Okay, there was a samba kind of a samba rock track on that same record. Okay. So, instead of playing the bass drum, bang, ga dong, ga dang, ga dong, ga he played the ostinato on the foot was boom, ga dong, boom, ga dong. So he let the space, so that, right? Yeah. You know. That left some space. He left in the there. space, so it made it sound more commercial. So then when he played his fly, flum, fly, boom, chicka dum, boom, chicka dum, he had that thing going on. So I never forgot this. They're playing the track back, and I'm in the booth, and I'm looking out. Jeff P is standing outside by a baffle. And he's going, now here's the tempo boom, chicka dum, chicka dum, chicka dum, right? And he's sitting there going like this. Wait, I'm going to stand up. Sitting there, he's standing up, and here's the bell. He's doing this all the way through the track. 
all the way down. You get to the end, and he's looking at me through the glass, and he goes, this is, that's the one, man. Mark, that, that's the one. Because we listened to about three different things, right? He goes, that's the one. So at that point, man, I went, when he's playing, his body's feeling halftime, and that's why his time feels so wide. It feels a little wider. So then with that lope, with his right hand, and he's laying back here, but he's, he's not up here, he's down here, his body. Moving to that, boom, chica, don't, chica, don't, chica. He's here. More space. More space. So it feels a little wider, his time feel. And when I saw that that day, it dawned on me, that's it. That was it. And but then he used to do this. <laughs> I don't know what that was about, but it looked cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know either. <laughs> but so, how did that song come to happen when you did the James Newton Howard and Friends record with Sheffield Lab that they did your song that you played tabla on? Tanduri. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, they needed a little bit more. They needed another tune, you know, a very short tune. So Jeff says, you know, he day before we we had two sessions on that album we went on a saturday and we went and rehearsed the tunes yeah and it was at that rehearsal james says we need a little more uh <clears throat> time we need a very short piece so uh jess says well uh why don't we play the blues and that you start, you know, uh, this was on Saturday. He says, we need a tabla, you know, tablas come in different sizes. But we needed one that would, uh, I had three tablas, and I can get an F, a D. There's about only three really good notes that you can get on a tabla. You you could stretch it a little bit, either up or down, but yeah. it's not. But I had a t big tablet that went down to a B flat. So I told him, "Why don't we play B flat blues? I'll just start playing." Yeah, and you know. So David Page was on the session because James doesn't play any jazz, you know. Right. So David just started playing the blues. Man, I started off, you know, done. Some T highs, yeah, you know, yeah. just playing around. But it took me a while to get a real clear B flat on that drum. Yeah. You know? But that's how it happened. We just needed a little bit, you know, it's a very, very short piece. But I'm still getting residuals on it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> amen, to, amen to back end. <laughs> Joe, it was great hanging with you, and um, you know we're here at DW with all the cats, and this was just a special day. I mean, just to be with you and to share all these stories and some of the stories. There's so many more, yeah. but uh, it's just a great hang. Well, as always, yeah. And for me, it was so great to be here with you and uh, DW people. You know, they're so in, you know that's what I love about DW, man. To you know offer these types of uh, absolutely programs for you know the kids coming up you know absolutely i mean don and everybody they're uh, the best they're artist friendly they get it you know dw yeah. gets it and the, <laughs> and the guys that helped out today and they're all drummers i absolutely. found out that's it's what i love about this place. break out the surdo <laughs> <laughs> that's right man lp's over here now. so Thank you, Eddie. It was <laughs> Thank a great Thank you, Joe. Joe, I'm kidding day. me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Ed Rossetti. And I'm Joe Picaro. And this is DW's Talking Shop. On the all-new DWDrums.com.